Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Stephen Kaler from the NIH, uh, here with Stephen Gray from UT Southwestern to uh, welcome you and thank you for joining us this morning for the annual symposium of the, uh, organized by the Neurologic and Ophthalmic Gene and Cell Therapy Committee, of which Stephen and I are members. And uh, we have an exciting program to which we're looking forward. And uh, our first speaker is uh, Dr. David Schaefer from University of California, Berkeley, uh, whose topic will be new AAVs for central nervous system targeting. Dr. Schaefer. I'd really like to thank the organizers of the symposium as well as the society for the chance to share some of our work with you today. So I wanted to uh, mention up front as well that I have several conflicts of interest, uh, the most relevant of which is that I'm co-founder and CSO of a company, 4D Molecular Therapeutics, that is conducting clinical development of engineered AAV vectors. So as we all know and have been enjoying seeing over the past 10 years, our field has been building momentum and we now have clear successes within several clinical trials involving AAV vectors, including for Leber's congenital amaurosis, which received FDA approval just uh, December. We know that these trials as well are based upon or utilize natural versions of AAV. However, these versions of AAV aren't necessarily targeted towards any particular cell or tissue within the body, and they're often inefficient on a given target cell. So we believe that engineered next generation versions of AAV have the potential to do full justice to clinicians and scientists within the field, and that's gonna be the topic of my discussion today. So the problems that a number of AV vectors as well as gene therapy vectors face in general are all well known to us. The fact that many of us have already been immunized against natural serotypes of AAV. These variants often distribute to the wrong tissues within the body, have inefficient spread once they reach the surface of those target tissues, have an incapacity to target specific cell types within those tissues, and then finally once they reach the surface of an intended target cell are often inefficiently taken up. So we began to work in this field about 20 years ago and uh, hypothesized that all of these issues with the natural serotypes arose from a kind of a no-brainer consideration, which is the fact that nature never evolved viruses for our convenience to use as medicines. So we began to uh, initiate the process of engineering these viruses to make them better for our purposes as pharmaceutical gene delivery vehicles, rather than being at the mercy of what, it, what nature has provided us. And we developed uh, this methodology about 20 years ago now to embrace the idea that these AAVs were provided to us through evolution, but to continue this process of viral evolution, but change the direction so that we end up guiding the viruses towards the properties that we need them to have for a given clinical application. So all evolution involves two steps, the creation of a gene pool and then the selection of the fittest. And the first step is shown here where we began to use wild type AAV capsids or the genes that encode them and genetically diversify them to create a series of libraries of AAVs. So uh, we've been continuously adding to our master library and just a, a couple of examples recently, I'm not gonna go through these in detail because they've been published. About three to four years ago, we created what we call ancestral reconstruction libraries in which we were guided by phylogeny to introduce diversity into key locations on the viral capsid surface. And on the left-hand side here, we have uh, what we call the schema shuffled libraries, which are genetically recombined chimeras of AAV where we used a computational approach called schema to choose where to introduce the breakpoints. So in some total now, we have 100 million different versions of AAV. We take these cap versions, these cap genes, package them into viral particles such that each particle is now composed of a variant capsid shell that surrounds the cap gene or the DNA that encodes that protein shell. So we always think of these as being barcoded with their own DNA. We can then play Darwin and select the fittest according to any number of selections, three examples of which I'll talk to you about today. We initially started this work uh, 15 years ago doing selections in vitro, but in progressively been heading in vivo, initially in rodents, but uh, more recently in larger animal models, including dog, pig, and primate. A couple examples, again, of which I'll talk to you about today. So since we've been doing this for, for some time, we now have over 30 publications in which we've utilized this approach to generate highly optimized AAVs to target a number of cell, tissue, and disease targets within the body, um, and including ones that address all of those concerns I mentioned to you earlier. So the first example I'm gonna be talking about today is within the brain, and then I'll be discussing two additional examples within the retina. So we all know that the brain is somewhat a difficult tissue to be able to transduce. It's very large, it's surgically delicate, and uh, to illustrate one challenge that the field faced, there was a clinical trial at Institute Pasteur that in order to deliver a DNA or an AAV encoding a lysosomal storage disease enzyme, 
They ended up introducing eight burr holes into the skull, followed by 16 injections, and this restored on the order of 14 to 17 percent of normal levels of the enzyme only. So we need better ways to get AV distributed throughout the central nervous system. One possibility is to use natural plumbing of the CNS, for example, vasculature, and intravenous administrations of AAV can lead to transduction for some particular variants. However, this does expose the vector to the full force of the immune system, and in addition, the majority of that virus still distributes elsewhere within the body. Uh, only a small fraction goes to the central nervous system. Another plumbing that can be used is the cerebral spinal fluid, and so we have been doing intrathecal administrations and have actually done evolution for IT administration of AV to be able to get vectors that can reach deep within the brain parenchyma. I'm not going to be talking about that today, and I'll be discussing some other approaches that we've been utilizing, uh, namely taking advantage of the structural and functional properties of neurons within the central nervous system in a process called retrograde transport. Uh, this was originally discovered by Brian Kaspar. I was a middle author on this first paper about uh, 16 years ago. And Brian then utilized this approach to be able to do an intramuscular injection of an AAV vector, get retrograde transport back to the spinal cord in order to sneak vector past the blood-brain barrier through that manner, express a neuroprotective factor that ended up extending the lifespan of animals in a model of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. The problem, however, was that this was uh, based upon AV2, and a number of other natural serotypes were tested for their capacity to undergo retrograde transport, and they were all found to be uniformly uh, too inefficient to be able to undergo human clinical translation. So we uh, addressed this idea that it's likely that no AAV in its evolutionary history has been rewarded for the capacity to undergo retrograde transport in a rare population of neurons in the central nervous system, so we began to evolve one that could do that took the entire 100 million variant library, injected it deep into the brain within this center called the pons, and we chose that because a large number of neurons in layer four and five of the, hum of the cortex, both in mouse as well as in human, send their projections to the pons. And this is a very long distance to be traveling for a vector, and this, as a result, represented a high bar for retrograde transport. After doing the injection of the library into the pons, we harvested the cortical tissue, recovered the AAVs that made it to that destination, repackaged them, re-injected them into the ponds, and repeated several times so that we ended up taking our entire library of, a num of 100 million variants and converging it down to just a small number of specialists that had been evolved for the capacity to be able to make this trip. We took the lead variant from that, packaged it with a fluorescent protein, TD tomato, injected it into the ponds, and found that we were essentially lighting up the entire brain or the cortex of the brain as a result of this now highly efficient retrograde transport. We wanted to quantify this, and instead of using a cytosolic uh, fluorescent protein, we switched over to a nuclearly localized one so that we could count cells stereologically and compare into a number of different controls the performance of our engineered vector. So this is AAV2. Uh, you can see that there's some dots up within the cortex. This is another engineered AAV from the field. There are more uh, dots up there as well. And this is our engineered variant over here where you can see that we're lighting up large swaths of the cortex. We quantified this stereologically, and uh, you can see compared to AV1 through AV9, these are, uh, have a very low level of retrograde transport. CAV2, or canine adenovirus, is actually used as a, a virus for retrograde transport studies within neuroscience as a field. You can see even it is not highly efficient, and uh, the AV2 retro variant that we created is uh, 50 to 100 fold more efficient in undergoing retrograde transport within the CNS. We then began to test the ability of this variant to undergo broad distribution across a number of different projections within the CNS. And perhaps my students went a little bit overboard, but they packaged a red fluorescent, green fluorescent, and blue fluorescent protein vector, shows three strategic locations within the brain to maximize spread. And you can see here in this coronal section through the cortex that we're lighting up large numbers of neurons just from these three injections. So we then used this uh, to see whether we could deliver a functional transgene, and uh, we uh, chose CRISPR-Cas9, and specifically one that was guided by an RNA to be able to attack and to cut a DNA encoding TD tomato within a transgenic animal, and showed that in greater than 90% of the cells within the cortex that retrogradely had taken up AAV and had Cas9 delivered to them, we were able to knock out that target gene, TD tomato. So that's one example within the CNS, and I'd like to continue on this theme of targeting and spread of virus through uh, dense tissues to be able to reach target cells, but switch over to a different tissue, which is within the retina. So the ideal route of administration to be able to get vector spread to the retina is through intravitreal. 
It's a non-invasive procedure, simply involves eye drops, local anesthesia, a very quick uh, injection on the order of five to 10 seconds. A good retinal surgeon can do 50 of these within a morning, and they're actually done millions of times a year in the United States for the delivery of anti-VEGF molecules to treat wet AMD. So the other approach is a subretinal injection in which the vector is introduced with a needle underneath the retina, which detaches the photoreceptor layer from the underlying retinal pigment epithelium, only transduces a small fraction of the surface area of the retina on the order of 10% of it, and involves a surgery in an OR, so it's, it's more complex. So why might you ask, would you use a subretinal injection compared to intravitreal? And the issue is that natural versions of AAV, when deposited into the vitreous fluid of the eye, can't make the trip through a couple hundred microns of dense tissue to be able to reach the target cells in the outer nuclear layer of the retina, namely the photoreceptors as well as the retinal pigment epithelium. And as a result, investigators in the clinical studies in the retina to date have had to use a subretinal injection. So we tested a number of natural serotypes of AAV for intravitreal administration with an acinomacaque. And you can see here, regardless of whether you use uh, AV2, AV5, AV8, or AV9, there's very limited transduction from the vitreous. So you specifically end up with a small circle or ring of retinal ganglion cells. And these are cells that happen to lie very superficial, close to the vitreous fluid within the eye, and are the easier targets from the vitreous. However, the majority of cells within the retina are not transduced, and it doesn't hit any photoreceptors. So we then took this uh, library and packaged it initially as a proof of concept within mouse. I'm going to skip past this pretty quickly because it's already published. And performed six rounds of evolution to generate this murine or a uh, rodent vector 7M8. And as you can see, when we administer this into the vitreous of a mouse eye, we get broad transduction. And the publication shows we're getting deep penetration into the retina and very strong and efficient transduction of both photoreceptor neurons and RPE within the mouse. But not surprisingly, evolution teaches you, you get what you select for. We created a mouse vector, and when we tried to translate this towards larger animal models, we ended up facing a number of barriers. The first of which is that the eye is quite simply larger within a dog, macaque, or in a human. And in addition, there are structural differences. Human beings have a phobia, dogs have a visual streak, a region of highly concentrated cone photoreceptors that are important to protect. The mouse doesn't have a phobia or a, a, a or this, uh, this concentration of, green, of uh, cone photoreceptors. And in addition, there's a layer of matrix proteins that lies between the vitreous and the underlying retina called the inner limiting membrane. This is a barrier to transduction we and others have shown, and uh, it's quite simply thicker within larger animal models. So when we took our mouse vector and put it into dog and monkey, you can see the results are somewhat underwhelming, where we had very limited transduction areas. So we dipped back into our library, which uh, in the intervening time had expanded from 10 million to 100 million variants, and began to conduct uh, the rounds of evolution within dog. So I should mention as well that all the work that we've done in retina, in mouse, and in dog was conducted in collaboration with John Flannery at UC Berkeley, and the work in dog was uh, conducted in collaboration with uh, William Beltran at Penn. So after six rounds of evolution within dog, we ended up getting some candidates. But we wanted to take advantage of technological advances that had occurred within the field in the intervening time between the dog and the mouse study that we did, uh, namely the advent of Illumina or next generation sequencing. So specifically, we began to sequence components within our library round after round. And uh, I mentioned that we have a number of different libraries in which we've introduced diversity in different ways. So we actually tracked six different libraries from the plasmid stage to the first time we packaged it into a library, and then round by round all the way through. And you can see that each one of these libraries is behaving as one might anticipate. Evolution ends up selecting for the fittest, and we're getting convergence to a smaller and smaller number of members. However, when we began to examine the distribution of variants within the original library, we saw something that was perhaps a, a bit troubling to us initially, uh, didn't end up being a concern. But this is the probability distribution of variants across the library. The number of times that each variant appears within the library um, ranked from left, which is the most abundant, to right, which is the least abundant. And you can see that for the majority of the distribution, it's pretty flat. So each variant has equal probability of appearing within each one of these libraries. But we have some variants that, for some reason, have an unfair advantage. They're overrepresented within that initial library. And we wanted to make sure that the variants that we selected by the end were not present at high frequency within that final selected pool simply because they had that unfair advantage from the very beginning. So what we began to do is to compare the distribution of variants one by one within the initial plasmid library versus round by round. 
And so shown here, if you have a 45 degree line, that would indicate that the variant is equally probable in appearing in the original plasma library versus a selected library. And uh, as you begin to progress through these selected libraries, you can see that we have variants that are popping up higher and higher. That is, they're overrepresented within the selection after round six compared to their distribution or their frequency within the original pool. However, we have this uh, population that happened to be quite abundant within the original library shown here in green. And some of those shown here in black end up being overrepresented within the final pool, again, because of this unfair advantage. But we have another population shown here in red, which are the ones that increased most in frequency throughout the process of evolution. And uh, these, therefore, are the ones that are likely to be the fittest. But we didn't want to discriminate against the, uh, the variants that happened to be overrepresented within the original library. So we developed an approach to actually test all of these in parallel. So specifically, what we did is took a number of variants on the order of 30, 20 to 30, and generated a series of vector plasmids, all encoding GFP, but where each one contained a unique nucleotide barcode in the three prime untranslated region downstream of the GFP coding sequence. So we packaged each one of these within uh, one of our 20 to 30 capsid variant candidates and took those pools, titered them, mixed them together in equimolar titers, and injected them into the eye of a dog. And this gave us the capacity to then isolate the retinal tissue from several dogs. We did this in three animals. Isolate regions throughout the entire retina, uh, section those tissues so that we could separate the retinal pigment epithelium from the photoreceptor layer, and then do sequencing so we could analyze biodistribution of both the DNA as well as analyze the levels of messenger RNA that were expressed from each one of those vectors. And this enabled us to choose both the vectors that made it to the right locations and the ones that actually deposited their DNA within the nucleus in a manner that could mediate the expression of high levels of GFP. So first of all, this is a GFP image of the entire library, and you can see that uh, each one of these encodes GFP, so we don't know which of the 30 was responsible for this GFP expression. You can see we're getting expression across all layers within the retina, including the RPE, which indicates, therefore, that there are at least some variants within our pool which are actually good. So we then um, rank ordered these variants, uh, shown here, for their capacity to reach the dog retinal pigment epithelium, as well as the outer nuclear layer as a whole, the photoreceptors, and um, also did the same corresponding experiment within mouse to begin to assess species specificity. And finally, I'll mention that we took this pool and actually doped it or included within it a couple of controls. So one thing to notice is that this is the rodent variant 7M8. It still rises close to the top within the mouse pool, which told us that we got what we selected for within mouse. But this variant is suboptimal by a good stretch within the dog. And furthermore, the variants that are top within the dog are actually suboptimal within the mouse, indicating that there's species specificity. And finally, something that was of comfort to us is that the AV2 control uh, was near the bottom in all cases. So we took the top dog variant, uh, this variant K9, uh, number 16, and packaged it in a couple of ways. So specifically, we took, in order to make the most out of a single animal, a GFP and put it under the control of a photoreceptor-specific promoter and took a TD tomato, red fluorescent protein, and placed it under the control of a retinal pigment epithelium-specific promoter and did this with a couple of variants. This is an engineered variant from the field that the reviewers asked us to take a look at. And uh, we find that this particular variant is able to penetrate into the photoreceptor layer to an extent and does also hit some uh, retinal pigment epithelial cells shown here in red. And this is the, uh, the engineered variant within DOG where you can see that we're uh, mediating very highly efficient transduction of both photoreceptors as well as RPE within this animal. So about three to four years ago, we took this technology and translated it into the private sector and co-founded a company called 4D Molecular Therapeutics that is focused on clinical translation of this technology to be able to get it into patients and products. And we've since industrialized this process in a couple of ways. First of all, that we've been conducting highly parallel uh, directed evolutions within a number of different target tissues, actually nine different tissues to date, and we've isolated over 50 novel engineered variants of AAV that have emerged from this evolution. And again, following upon the theme that evolution teaches you, you get what you select for, we're doing all these selections within non-human primate, which is the most relevant preclinical model prior to translating into human. So I want to talk to you for the remainder of the time about our lead clinical vector, which is within the retina. So we conducted this now, um, this directed evolution for six rounds within a cinema macaque, 
And I'll mention as well that uh, we've increased the diversity of the libraries, so we now have over 35 libraries in which diversity has been introduced into AV capsids in different ways, and the sum total now is several hundred million variants. So the lead variants that emerged after six rounds of evolution, we retrospectively analyzed and quantified the fraction of the pool that emerged from every round of evolution that was composed or contained this lead variant. And you can see that regardless of which layer we're looking at, the INL, the retinal ganglion cells, the RPE, or the photoreceptor layer, this variant is the top one and was the top one even dating back to the third round of evolution. And you can see um, evolution or selection and action is increasing the frequency of that variant. We then began to package it with GFP and analyze its performance in vitro as well as in vivo. Initially, we did this in vitro and we wanted to ask the question, does this variant, which was selected on a cinemacaque, had the capacity to infect a human cell, a corresponding human cell. So we generated retinal pigment epithelium from human embryonic stem cells, vastly characterized this RPE tissue to show that it had a number of marker expressions as well as functional uh, phenotypes reminiscent of functional RPE, and uh, infected these cells with both AV2, the variant used in uh, Luxterna, as well as the R100 variant, as we call it, the variant that was selected within the non-human primate. And as you can see, this variant was significantly more efficient compared to AV2 on human RPE. We also tested it on human photoreceptors, and it actually took about four months worth of time to fully differentiate and mature these photoreceptors from human embryonic stem cells. But we ended up with photoreceptors expressing a number of different markers of uh, mature cells, and we find as well that this variant, uh, R100, is capable of transducing these human photoreceptors in a dish. We then took this into cinemacaques to characterize its distribution and GFP expression. And I'll show you some images initially of live RETCAM, uh, fundus fluorescence, and then uh, histology. So specifically, we took this variant, injected it into the vitreous of the eye of a dosage of either 10 to the 11th or 10 to the 12th vector genomes. And this is uh, the expression after around a week, where you can see that there's, we're now beginning to get the emergence of this ring around the fovea, this layer of retinal ganglion cells, as well as punctate expression in a number of other regions. However, uh, we actually took this study to six months in life and continuously monitored these animals. And after two weeks, we end up with very, very broad expression. And then um, at 22 weeks, uh, just before we ended up terminating the study, we see very, very widespread expression throughout the entire retina. And this was actually a number of animals. We took the tissue and conducted extensive histology on it to the tune of several thousand tissue sections. And I'll mention as well that uh, this image, due to the auto contrast or the auto exposure of the ret cam, um, ended up tuning its level of exposure to the brightest levels, but we in, in fact have GFP expression across the entire surface area of the retina within these animals. And when we section through them and use antibodies, we can see that as well as GFP intrinsic fluorescence, we see strong expression within both photoreceptors as well as the RPE. So I'd like to, uh, to close with a few bullet points saying that, uh, like many of you, we're one of those groups that views viruses as gifts of nature. However, nature didn't intend them to be used as professional pharmaceutical gene delivery vehicles, so it's up to us to engineer them to optimize them for that purpose. So we've been developing this idea of using evolution as an engine to create optimal designer vectors where we can fundamentally reprogram the virus to mediate highly efficient transduction and delivery to any cell or tissue target in the body through the most clinically relevant route of administration. And we've used this to significantly increase the efficiency of the virus between 100 and 1,000 fold in some cases, target delivery to particular cell types, as well as in work I didn't talk about today, enhance the ability of these viruses to evade pre-existing antibodies or other immune responses in vivo. And finally, uh, within our company, we're translating this work into the human clinic. We're actually in the midst of our first uh, GLP talk study within non-human primates to gather IND enabling data to go into our first uh, clinical target, which is choroideremia. So thanks so much for your time and attention. I'd be happy to address any questions. This paper is now open for discussions. Please come to the microphone and uh, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Casey McGuire from MGH. Hi, um, Casey. I really enjoyed your talk. I, I remember in your earlier papers, Dave, that you had um, uh, you used limited amounts of DNA to transfect in mm -hmm. per capsid, so you didn't have cross packaging. Yes. Then I've seen some subsequent publications that show that for some unknown reason, that may or may not be an issue. Um, they've been able to transfect in higher amounts of plasma to get higher titers. Mm -hmm. Has that been your, um, what you found, or do you still stick to, like, trying to use small amounts of, of capsid plasmid per cell? 
Yeah, the question is that, uh, you know, as a concept to be able to do evolution, you need to have the phenotype, the capsid, the protein, attached or linked to the genotype, which is, you know, the, the capsid gene that's in capsidated within. So that means that if you have a packaging cell, at most it can only take up one cap gene, otherwise you're expressing this, you know, mosaic virus that has multiple versions of a cap particle or cap within the, the particle. So yeah, we still do limiting dilutions of the plasmids so that every cell takes up zero or one plasmid. We don't really have problems with titer. You know, we've done um, directed evolution for delivery t within a non-human primate, a macaque, you know, multiple kilogram animal. Um, IV to liver, IV to skeletal muscle, IV to heart, IV to synovial joint. So we can package enough virus um, within the library to be able to, to even transduce through a systemic administration. Uh, yes? So, thank you for the beautiful talk. My name is Stylianos Michalakis, LMU Munich, Germany. So uh, I have a question on the R100 variant that you showed at uh, the end, very promising. Um, so uh, the, the images that you showed uh, with the GFP in the lower left end, uh, was it uh, modified GFP so that it targeted to the segments of the photoreceptors, uh, or what? Yeah, it was uh, just a, st a standard cytosolic GFP, so it would be space filling within the cytosol and nucleus. So when uh, this spared the, the uh, cell bodies of the photoreceptors? Uh, it would be localized anywhere where there's, <coughs> you know, cytosol within the cell. So it would uh, hit the cell bodies, it would hit the, you know, outer segments as well as the nucleus. Okay, and uh, second question, can you comment on the packaging uh, efficiency mm -hmm. of this R100? Yes, uh, so packaging efficiency is something we obviously pay close attention to. Uh, <laughs> so the process of doing the directed evolution involves every single round we package the library. So this, very, or this process actually selects for good packagers as well. If something didn't package very well, it would get left by the evolutionary roadside. So the variants that emerge from it, you know, there's some variability in tighter efficiency, but uh, the variants typically package quite well. Hey, David, congratulations on all your success. Uh, oh, thank you. But, so you show very nicely when you inject into the ponds, you identified some very beautiful serotypes that achieve widespread axonal transport. If you take those same serotypes and inject it into muscle, do you also see similar effects at the neuromuscular junction, or are your serotypes central specific? Uh, they're not centrally specific. They do go from muscle to spinal cord. We didn't conduct that work. We, we actually put that variant on adgene, and it's gone to a number of other labs, and we've been hearing about their applications for it. Uh, so some people have used it in non-human primate to an extent, um, but like you, to address your question, yes, if you inject it intramuscularly, others have told us that it transports back to the spinal cord. Thank you. We've not reproduced that ourselves, though. Hello, Sheila Hi. Baker from the University of Iowa. I'm interested in finding vectors that can go all the way from proof of concept in mouse all the way to non-human primates. So along those lines, did you test your 40R100 back in rodents again? We have not put it back in rodents. Uh, so the lead clinical program is corduremia, mm -hmm. and there's not a very good mouse model. So we've actually used human iPSCs that we derived from patient fibroblasts from corduremia to be able to show transgene efficacy. So the IND package is going to be, and FDA bought into that, so the IND package is actually going to be transgene efficacy or activity within an IPS cell combined together with farm tox by distribution in the primate. So that's not going to involve a mouse. For future studies where there's a stronger mouse model, we'll actually characterize transduction in mouse, but we haven't done that yet. But I will mention this. For some of the canine variants, we actually did test them within mouse. I showed you the kind of the genome sequencing data, but we have GFP data as well, and about half of them work really well on mouse, the other half don't. They have uh, dog specificity. I've got one last question. Uh, David, do you, is it conceivable that, that human variability could impact the efficacy of, of even these directed evolved capsids? Yeah, human variability is, you know, of course, a significant challenge. Um, you know, we've tried to de-risk as much as we can preclinically. Uh, so we're not, you know, for example, using a, a syngeneic mouse strain. So we're using non-human primates, which themselves, of course, have a significant amount of genetic variability. We're using several uh, IPS and embryonic stem cell lines, which, you know, to the extent they represent different genomes, might inform us. But yeah, you're right. Once you jump to human, we're going to end up with uh, a similar challenge to to most biologics or pharmaceuticals yeah. that go into human. Yeah. Well, perfect. Thank you. Wonderful talk, perfect timing, and uh, we're ready for our second speaker.